All right. This is another one of those passages that we're not going to go through literally verse by verse. We just read the entire passage. Um, but basically, we can see this kind of ties in with, with last week, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But what we're seeing here, just the, the real broad overview of this passage, obviously, the Levites now are getting their possession. Now, we know that they don't get an inheritance and possession the same way that the whole rest of the tribe of Israel, of the tribes of Israel, got their possessions because they got like land inheritance that they were going to pass down from family to family. What they got, though, was a place to live because they have to stay somewhere. And the way that the course of the work of the Levites was is that they didn't all just reside in Jerusalem or anywhere where, you know, where God's name was, was where the city was going to be where the temple was going to be. They didn't all just live there all at the same time. That'd be too many people. So God gave them cities to dwell in throughout all of Israel. And there's multiple purposes for that as well, too. When they weren't doing the work of literally serving God in the tabernacle or in the temple, they would, all, they would be judging in Israel in their areas. And I'm going to prove that to you. And this is actually what the main focus of the sermon is going to be tonight. Because what we see here in chapter number 21, at least one of the things that stood out to me, in chapter 20, we talked about the city of refuge. Remember that? Where the slayer can flee into. And that was going to be a place where they could find a sanctuary. They could find safety. They could find refuge and hope that justice then can be done because they're going to go to that place and whoever is going to bring a claim against them, it's going to have to be brought before the elders and they're going to have to determine what needs to be done so that things can be done in order. They could go back and have their trial and then have justice served and then go back to that city if they really weren't guilty of murder. They can go back into that city of refuge. And it's no coincidence that the Bible's bringing up now in chapter 21. Chapter 20 explained the cities of refuge and it told us where they were going to be. Chapter 21 explains that it just so happens to be that the that six cities of refuge all happen to be six cities that were given by inheritance to the Levites. It's no coincidence that those were the cities that were chosen as well as the cities that are given to the Levites as their inheritance. Now, one of the things that we see here when we read through chapter one, of course, they get the city. So they, they dwell in the city and the suburbs. So basically that whole location, the downtown area and the whole metro area of whatever city they're in is where they can have houses, they can live, they can reside, they can have their oxen. They don't have these big fields and do their agriculture and farming and stuff. That's not what they had to, um, for inheritance or anything like that. They just were able to live and survive. But they're in these cities now and they dwell there. And that is given to them so they always have a place to stay. They always have a place to live while they're doing the work of the Lord. And um, now I don't know if this necessarily has extra meaning or not, but one of the things I thought was interesting when I was looking at this, it actually mentions only five of the six cities in chapter 21. Even though the sixth city, I think it's Gozan, was the one that doesn't say, or Gezer, Gezer was one of the cities mentioned in chapter number 20. And I'm just kind of throwing this out there for your own, you could look at it or not, or to see if there's, I don't know, I'm not sure that there's anything necessarily to it. But five times in chapter 21, it says the name of the city and that that was the city of refuge. But there are six cities of refuge. So one time it doesn't mention it, and it's, and it's in, um, in chapter 21, it's talking about Gezer with her suburbs. It doesn't mention that that's a city of refuge but we get that from the previous chapter. So they are all given to the Levites. And it's also interesting too, because there's three main um, tribes within the, the children of Levi, the, the Levites. You have uh, Gershon and Kohath and Merari, right? Those are the three main branches of the Levites. And they're, they're a representative of, uh, they get two cities each of the, the cities of refuge. So they're distributed among the family of the Levites by two per tribe in their location. So um, that's the way it's distributed. Now, like I said, we're not going to go through this. I would like you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17, though, because I'm going to prove to you why this makes sense and that the Levites really were to be the people who were judging and to help judging the land. And they were the ones that were looked at. I mean, it makes sense. They're the ones that should know God's word really well because they're doing the service of the Lord. 
they should know the ins and outs of God's law. I mean, it, their lives in many ways depended on it when they're doing the service of the Lord. If they did things wrong, they could literally lose their life. So you would think that if anyone's going to be studying God's word, it should be the Levites to make sure they're doing everything right when they go into the tabernacle or when they go into the temple, that they're not breaking God's commandments. So these are the people that you're going to be looking to for judgment. But even in God's law, it tells us that the Levites are going to be the ones to bring judgment and, and to be able to, to discern and be able to judge between the people. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood. So this is talking about, you know, like murder, right? Which is a perfect reason why you have these cities of refuge. So you have this hard situation. It's a really important matter. This is a big deal. It says between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. So he's saying you get a hard matter, you know, the little things, he's saying you don't have to go to them for everything. Right? The simple matters, simple disputes, you ought to be able to just handle that yourselves. But he's saying, when you get a bigger problem here, a bigger dispute, blood and blood, stroke and stroke, right? Whatever is going on, some, some bigger deal. He says, bring that unto the Levites. Bring that unto the judge that's going to be in those days. And they're going to give you the judgment. And this continue on here, it says in verse number 10, And thou shalt do according to the sentence which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall show thee and thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee thou shalt do thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand nor to the left and the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. This is God's authority being given to the Levites, given to these judges to say, these are the ones who are going to judge your matters of law. And God's saying, they have the authority. And whatever they tell you is a judgment, you better listen to them. Because that is, they're the ones who I have given the responsibility to be able to make good, proper judgment in these areas. And he's saying, in fact, if you, decide, if you go to law and you have your case heard before the Levites and you say, well, who are these guys anyways? You know, because they get a ruling against you. I'm just going to go like... I'm not going to follow that. I'm not going to listen to their, to their judgment. I'm not going to obey that. That's the death penalty. That's serious. It, and it doesn't say only in capital crimes, then, you know, no. It doesn't matter what the offense was. If they're going for judgment and they reject the judgment that God has ordained there, he's saying they're going to be put to death. And that's how he's establishing, saying, and, and that's how much to the degree of the power that they had as far as giving judgment and, and how it was to be respected. That's how much it was. And it, and it went to, it's interesting, it goes to the priests. It goes to the men of God. Now they're all, you know, God's people. But it's the, the Levites, not even just the priests, but the Levites, because the priests had a specific function of the whole job of the Levites. All of the Levites served God. The priests were the ones that were doing a lot of the sacrifices and doing a lot of that. But the Levites, if you remember, they had other tasks besides just the specific line of Aaron where they would take care of the tabernacle and set things up and take things down and do that service of the Lord. And then even into the temple, you had men singers, women singers, and, and the, you know, their jobs kind of shifted a little bit when the tabernacle was, was transferred to the, to the temple. But they still had service to the Lord. And basically, it's, tell, it's informing us here that the Levites and the judge would be the ones that would make this decision. Turn to Nehemiah chapter number 8. Mm -hmm. 
We're going to see one more example here in the Old Testament of the Levites given this authority. We're going to start reading in verse number 1 of Nehemiah chapter 8. The Bible says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside, beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Aniah and Urijah and Elkiah and Maasiah on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah and Mishael and Melchiah and Hashem and Hashbadana and Zechariah and Mesholam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So we see here uh, another instance where the, it's the Levites that are the ones in charge of interpreting God's law. They're the ones, they're reading God's law. They stand up. They give the reading of God's law and then they're causing the understanding. They're saying, okay, now here's what it means. Here's the application. This is what God said and now this is the meaning. This is exactly what we see in churches. This is the job that God has given unto pastors is to take his law, to take his words, to read it. We go through and study God's word and then also provide the understanding, make the application, make this so that hey, this is what he's saying and what this means is that when you do this and when you do that, you know, you're violating God's law here. This is what God wants you to do. They give that understanding. That's the position that they had. And that's a position of judgment. So what we're going to cover is this, this whole judgment that God gives to the people of God, especially those that are serving him. There's a, a position of judgment that they had. The Levites were judges. Because they knew God's law. That's why. Now, we live in a society, unfortunately, where people just shudder at the word judge or judgment. And who are you to judge? How often have you heard that? Who, who do you think you are? What makes you think you can judge? Well, you know, that actually, that attitude is found a couple times in Scripture. And you know that every time that attitude is found, it's always a really wicked person who is bringing that up. The first example that comes to mind is in Genesis 19. Genesis 19, verse number 9. You don't have to turn there if you want to. You probably know where I'm going. This, is, of course, is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19. And when Lot goes out to the wicked men that were trying to defile and force the angels that came into his house because they're wicked perverts, he goes out to them and tries to plead with them and says, you know, my brother, don't do so wickedly. Don't, don't be so vile as to do this thing. And how do they respond to him? Verse number nine says, and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now it will deal worse with thee than with them. He's saying, oh, now he's going to try to be a, now you're going to judge us. Oh, you're going to judge us? Now we're going to do more, more harm to you. We're going to do even worse to you than we thought to do unto them. That's their attitude. Who are you to judge? We get the same attitude, and that's from the, I mean, that's from the Sodomites. But isn't that what we get from the Sodomites today? Oh, don't judge me. <laughs> don't judge me. It's love. Well, I am going to judge you. Because judge isn't a bad word. Judge is in the Bible. In fact, I'm going to go home and read the book of Judges. 
Because it's of God to judge. Amen. Exodus chapter 2, we have another example of someone <coughs> answering someone who is actually trying to say what's right. Because, look, Lot was not your ideal Christian by any means. But what he was saying was right. Absolutely right from God's word that what they were doing was wicked and vile. Okay, that was right. He was making a righteous judgment there. And what we see in Exodus chapter 2 with Moses, the same thing. Moses was, was saying what was right to some wicked people, to his own brethren. In verse number 13, the Bible says, And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? So he's got two Hebrews, his brethren, they're fighting. And one guy is clearly in the wrong because he says to the guy that's in the wrong, the, the wrong wicked doer saying, hey, why are you hitting him? Why are you fighting him? And look at what his answer is. And he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. So he said, well, who, who are you to judge? What makes you think you can be a judge? So again, another example, that guy was wicked. Now, it would appear that Moses was being a hypocrite since he killed a guy and he's telling him, what are you doing hitting him, right? And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But notice who the person is, though, that hates the judgment. It's the evildoer. It's the wicked person. They don't want the judgment. They don't want to hear the judgment. So they're going to say, well, who do you think you are to judge? This same story is referred to in the book of Acts. Because Moses was afraid of that and he left. But I love how this, this story is referenced that in Acts chapter 7, where uh, Stephen is given that, break, that great sermon before he's martyred and just going into this great history of Israel and stuff. And he brings up this story of Moses. And he, and he recounts it saying, you know, even, even covering... That, uh, that he said that, you know, who made you a judge? In verse number 27, he says, but he, did, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? So he's basically just recapping what we just read in Exodus. But then jump down to verse number 35, because then he says, this Moses whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. So to answer that guy's question, well, who made you a ruler and a judge? Well, God did. God's the one that made Moses the judge. It really was of God. And this is what drives me nuts about this whole, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's irritating. Again, this is, a, this is a little political, but when I see people who because there's so much good and truth to like a libertarian type of a mindset of giving a lot of freedom to people and trying to limit the scope of government. But people take that to you know, follow these philosophies of men and get involved and take it to as far as like anarchy. And a lot of, I'll get, I'll, 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 you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding of what the word anarchy even means. Typically when you hear anarchy, what most people are, are taught to believe is just you just think of people dressed up in black suits and just going and just breaking stuff, right? And just causing chaos. That's not literally what the word means and that's not the political philosophy behind it either, but the word anarchy means no rulers. So if you have a monarchy, there's one ruler. If you have an oligarchy, there's a few rulers, right? Anarchy means there is no ruler. And that is a political thought that that you know, people come up with as a philosophy of man that thinks that that's the best way to govern and that no one really has the right to exert, the, to have these extra rights over other people. They'll say, well, we all have the same rights. We're all equal. Well, yeah, that's fine and good in a naturalistic sense. If there is no God, then I can see where you can follow that. That would make sense and be a logical argument. But the big problem comes in when you have a God that says, I'm giving power to people to execute my law and do my judgment. Because now when you have God involved, he says, no, I do want to have a ruler. I want to have judges. I want to, I'm going to set people with the authority. And if you don't listen to their judgment, then you are going to be put to death. That's the way that God established it. So guess what? 
God does want rulers, and you cannot say that you believe the Bible, and you believe the Bible is God's word, and hold to an anarchist philosophy politically, because then you're saying, well, what God said isn't quite as important, or it's not as good of an idea as anarchism is. And Christians need to watch out for that. Don't get, don't get sucked into just these vain philosophies. Stick with God's word. It won't steer, steer you wrong ever. God's system of judgment. Now, God did not intend for a monarchy either. But God did set up a system of government that had judges. And the judges knew God's law and would be there to have wisdom to execute God's laws and to be there for the punishment of evildoers because evil people need to be punished. And someone needs to have the authority to punish those evil people. And God ordained certain men to have that authority. And it's people who knew the Bible, people who knew God's word. That's who he wanted doing it. And it makes perfect sense. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 7. As I was saying, we live in this society where people have been brainwashed into thinking that, you know, because they'll say, oh, well, yeah, you know, it was real judgmental back in the Old Testament, and you're just looking at these Old Testament priests and, and things like that, and we're looking at the judgment. Well, we're going we're gonna to make the application. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to see the biblical concept and truths from the Old Testament and apply them in the New Testament because this concept hasn't changed. But people have been deceived into hearing one part of one verse repeated so often. No, oh, judge not. Doesn't the Bible say not to judge? Doesn't it say you're supposed to judge not? You hear that all the time. You, you try to say what you try to stand up for truth. And you and you say, you know, fornication is wicked, it's wrong. People shouldn't be shacking up together before. A, well, who are you to judge? I thought the Bible says not to judge. You say, getting drunk is a sin. It's wicked. It's wrong. People shouldn't be doing it. Oh, yeah, you're a real good judge. Huh? I thought the Bible said not to judge. And then, of course, the big one is the sodomites. You say, it's filthy. It's vile. It's disgusting. And then, well, you can't judge. Why don't you look at your own book? It tells you not to judge. Ignoramuses telling you what the Bible says who've never picked it up and read a page of it in their life. They just like to repeat what they've heard because they think it sounds good. And if they have read it, shame on them because... They didn't understand a lick of it if they're going to come and say that. And shame on the Christians who repeat that because they're not reading the Bible for themselves and they're just hearing whatever they, their, their pastor that's tickling their ears is going to tell them. Let's actually look at the passage and see what the Bible says about judging, shall we? Chapter, or chapter 7, verse number 1. This is where people get their concept of not judging because they read the first two words of Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1, and then they stop reading. And then they just don't want to know, just, okay, well, let's, let's go to something else more fun. I don't know. <laughs> judge not. Oh, there it is. Judge not. I guess we can't judge ever. There's no judgment. Let's go home. Okay, how about we actually just read the context and see what he's saying here. Judge not that ye be not judged. Okay, that gives me a little bit more insight. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now it's starting to make a little bit more sense. He's saying, okay, the reason why I'm saying to judge not, he's saying because the same degree or the same severity or whatever judgment that you're going to give on someone else, you're going to be held to the same standard. If you're going to make a judgment, it applies equally to everybody. Makes sense. So it's basically be careful with how you judge because it's going to come back to you. And then it continues further. Verse number three. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. And this is where we get in verse number five. The, the main purpose of this passage being explained here, what, what does it boil down to? Thou hypocrite. It's about hypocrisy in judgment because he's saying, because the hypocrite, they're the ones that want to tell everyone else what to do when they're guilty of all of those things. So if the hypocrite is judging someone, 
You know, the guy, the, the pastor that's secretly going home and getting drunk and no one knows about it, but then he's standing up and judging all the people, all oh, you drunkers and everything else. You better watch out because you're guilty of those things. And that judgment's going to come down on you. That's being a hypocrite. And that's going to be applied to you. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. This is talking about, okay, you say mote, you know what a mote is. Mote and beam, even if you don't know what the word mote is, you could probably understand what the Bible's trying to say here. It's using two extreme examples. You know what a beam is. I mean, think about you have beams in, in buildings, right? They're just big, long pieces of wood. And it's an exaggeration, obviously, saying, okay, you're trying to help someone that's got a really small speck of whatever in their eye. They've got some small thing. And you've got this huge problem. I mean, you can't see clearly at all because you've got this big old beam sticking out of your face. And then you're trying, you're trying to help that guy? You're judging that guy because he has some small imperfection, some problem that you can barely even see. You can't even see, but you can see that there's, he's having some problems and some issues because it, you know, he's, he's rubbing his eye and stuff. And, oh, here, let me help you out with that. And you walk up to him and you're like, whoa, hold on a second there, buddy. I don't, don't, don't get too close to my eye because you can't see a thing. And that's, that's what he's saying. The hypocrite is the person... They've got their own very serious problems and they're going to go ahead and try to judge other people and judge their sins and tell them why everything they're doing is wrong. He's saying, you know, but notice what this says. This doesn't say, well, because that happens, no one can ever make any judgments. So don't ever say that anything that anyone's doing is wrong. Is that, is that what the passage said there? No. What does it actually say to do? He says, first, take care of your problems. Take care of that big problem. Get that big beam out of your eye. And then you could go ahead and help that person out. So who are supposed to be the people that are judging? The ones that don't have the big beam sticking out of their eye. The one who've already prepared themselves and cleaned up their act enough to be able to see clearly. Now, they may not be perfect. They're not perfect. But they don't got big old beams sticking out of their eyes. They can see clearly enough to help those because that's what, you know, ultimately what a judgment's going to do. It should be to help the person who's guilty of those sins to get right, to get that, to get that speck out of their eye, get that moat out of their eye. You need to be told you're wrong in order to correct the problem. Many people have problems. They don't even realize they're wrong. It's another good purpose for judgment. And it's especially important when people are going around and calling evil good and good evil. And people are saying that the most vile, wicked things are okay and we should tolerate that and accept that and embrace that and love that. No! We need to exhibit justice and judgment and yes, we're going to judge between right and wrong. And there was one other passage in the Old Testament that I, that I just realized now that I, that I had left out. Um, it's one where the, the, the priest, it's given to the Levites and to the priests to discern for the people and to give them judgment and to, and to tell them between the, 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 pro, the holy and the profane thing. If you remember that passage I'm talking about, I actually had that in my notes. And uh, I'll confess to you, I forgot my notes on my printer at home, so I had to rewrite my notes. That's why I started a few minutes late today. But uh, forgive me for my fault. But I remembered everything but the one, that was the one passage I couldn't remember, and that's what it was. So I'm going to have to look that one up again later. But you guys, that's your homework. You go up and look, and look that verse and, and verify that what I'm saying is right about that because the Levites had that job as well to, to tell between the holy and the profane things. And, um, but that's what we have today. People, people don't understand that. That's the job. That is the job within church is to provide that judgment. God has ordained for that to be the case. Yes, even into the New Testament. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. This passage has come up multiple times in the past few weeks.
Because if that passage that we just read in Matthew chapter 7 is telling us just not to judge ever, now you have contradictions on your hand within the scripture. Now you've got a, a, a God that can't make up his mind on whether or not we should judge if that's really what that verse is saying. If it's just saying you can't ever judge anybody. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13 say, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And well, I'm not going to go over all 1 Corinthians chapter 5, but it's all these people that are doing certain sins that we're supposed to not even associate with. We're not supposed to go out and have a meal with. And he's saying, if they do these things, you know, put that wicked person away from among you. And he says, well, well, what am I, you know, what do I have to do with them that are without? Like, I don't judge those people that are without because he says in verse 13, God's going to judge those people. The people that are not saved, the heathen of the world, they have a judgment and God's going to judge them and they're going to burn in hell. He says, but, but he says, do not ye judge that I'm within. He's talking about within the church, within the body of Christ. Says, don't you judge those people? And because you're supposed to, he says, therefore, put away from among yourselves a wicked person. Because you should be judging. Because you should have nothing to do with them. That is a righteous judgment. Flip over to chapter 6, because he continues the same thought. That was at the end of chapter 5. Chapter number 6 in 1 Corinthians says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? He's saying, how dare you? If you have a problem with someone else, you, if some issue arises... You're going to go take your brother to law, meaning like going to the courthouse that's here, like, like in their times, the Roman government, like you're going to go before the Romans and you're going to have them do justice in your situation. He's saying, what are you thinking? You have a matter against another. You go to law before the unjust, like they're not even just. You're going to try to get justice from people who are unjust. They don't understand wisdom and, and, and God's judgment and what true justice is. And he says, and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matter? He's saying, don't you know the saints, the sanctified, the believers, you're going to judge the whole world one day. You're going to be put in that position of authority. You will be the judges and if that's the case, you can't even judge the smallest things. Like, really? Verse number three, know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. And he's rebuking these people, one, for going to law. They have a problem with someone in the church. He's saying, first of all, if, you got pro if someone did you wrong, why don't you just take the wrong? Why don't you just say, whatever, move on, and just, and just allow yourself to be defrauded by someone else in church and just say, forget it. But if you're going to go to, he's like, if it still is a problem, then why are you going before the unjust? You're not going to get justice from the unjust. Don't go to the heathen. Don't bring your brother in Christ to law before the heathen. And he gives all these reasons why you can do the judgment right there. You can settle the matter within the church. You don't have to go outside to these other people to get justice. Don't you have anyone in church that reads their Bible? Don't you have anyone that understands wisdom? He's saying, that's a shame to you. You don't have somebody that can just say, this is right and this is wrong because God's word says so. You have nobody that can do that within your church? Then you got a bigger problem in your church when nobody can do that. You need to start reading God's word. Judging. Yes, a judgment. 
And it's funny that people only want to complain about the Christian judgment, right? They don't have a problem with judges that are down at the courthouse, right? If someone does them wrong, what are they going to do? They're going to sue them. They're going to go to court. They're going to stand before a judge. You don't ever hear these people that say, oh, don't judge me, going to the court and say, oh, don't judge them when, when they're suing someone else, yes. right? Why you got to be so judgmental? Why are you judging them? Oh, wait, because you want them to judge them because they did wrong to you. Yeah. Well, you know what we're judging? You're doing wrong against God. And in Christ's stead, we're going to stand here and say, that's wrong, that's wicked, thus saith the Lord, and we are going to judge. And God's given us the authority, yea, and, and the obligation to judge. Turn to John chapter number 7. There are other places in 1 Corinthians 7. I didn't have the time to get them all back down here because there's, there's, multiple, there's multiple places in the Bible that tell you to judge, where it's literally saying to judge, to judge, to judge. But we're going to get now out of Jesus Christ's own mouth, the words that were recorded in Scripture of what Jesus actually says here in... Um, well, let's get it in context. Let's start reading verse number 23. If a man on the Sabbath day received circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? So basically what they're doing is they're trying to condemn Jesus Christ for healing on the Sabbath day. And he's bringing up an example. What he does, is he brings an example of how they're hypocrites because they allow for someone to be circumcised. They allow for someone to, in a sense, you know, receive harm. And he's saying like, well, you allow for circumcision on the Sabbath, but you're not going to allow for someone to be made whole, for someone to be healed on the Sabbath day? And he follows that up with that question with verse 24. It says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Judge righteously. You're not judging a right judgment. So Jesus Christ is literally telling them, commanding them, judge righteous judgment. You need to judge, and you need to judge right. Now, I'm not for bad judgment or wrong judgment. You shouldn't be judging if you're judging incorrectly. But it doesn't mean you can never judge. You judge right all day long. Jesus says, judge right. And what Jesus is doing here, if you want to turn back to, you keep your place here. We're going to go back to John chapter 5 in just a second. But in Leviticus chapter 19, basically Jesus is just summarizing what Leviticus 19 says. And God's law for judging, Leviticus 19, verse number 15, the Bible says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So saying you need to judge righteously. Judge righteous judgment. And Leviticus 19 gives us a little bit more detail into how you can judge righteously, saying don't respect the person of the poor and honor the person of the mighty. He's saying it shouldn't matter whether they're rich or poor, whether they're famous or, or despised. It doesn't matter who the person is. The judgment is God's judgment. The judgment is according to Scripture. It has nothing to do with where they came from or how much influence they have or your friend or relative. The judgment that is righteous, that is right, is strictly according to God's law and God's commandment, and that's the way that you judge. You don't give any type of weight or creed or balance to any person and be a respecter of persons. And again, here's another problem within churches. Yep. It's a big problem within churches that want to sweep things under the rug when their evangelist or pastor or missionary or whoever is caught and found guilty 
of being a pervert or being a pedophile or doing some wicked acts or being an adulterer and they just want to sweep it under the rug. And they're a respecter of persons. Whereas if someone just out in the congregation was found guilty of committing adultery, they're going to put them up and publicly shame them before everyone else. But oh, 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 when the pastor does it, let's just be hush-hush about this. Let's just move them over into another ministry and let's not talk about it. And let's not make sure that real justice is actually done because it's my buddy that I've known for a long time. And we don't want to bring shame. We don't want to bring embarrassment to our church. Well, if you didn't want to have shame and embarrassment to your church then your pastor shouldn't have been a pervert or whatever, whatever the case may be. Don't be a respecter of person in judgment because if you thought that that was bad enough, whatever was going on, you're making it even worse. You're making God's anger increase by not bringing the judgment that needs to be brought out and dealt with and handled appropriately. You have no integrity. People aren't, you're, you've ruined, you know, it's bad enough to have that type of a mark and a scar from a man who's someone who's in a position of authority to bring that to damage and ruin a testimony of a church. But it's even worse to then cover it up. At least if you bring it out, you can have some respect and some integrity to say, well, at least these people still do hold the scripture because they're not, they, it doesn't matter who it is, they're going to hold them responsible and judge righteously and at least then you could still say you're true to god and not just following a man and not just staying true to some man last place i return john chapter 5 again more words of jesus christ this helps us will help us to discern how to judge righteously so we saw in joshua 21 that basically it's the levites who were given the cities of refuge, because that's where the judgment was going to be for the manslayer. We also saw then um, that the Levites were the ones who were given the task of giving the judgment. And it makes sense because they knew God's law. We see that then going forward into the New Testament. Nothing has really changed. I mean, the priesthood has changed, but this concept of judging and judging righteously, it still falls within God's realm, which would be the church. Right Back then, it was within the, the priesthood or the Levites, the, in, in, in the, the job of Levites to do the judging. Now we saw in 1 Corinthians, hey, can't you guys judge? Can't you judge these matters? Can't you just judge within the church? Don't you have someone that has wisdom and understanding? And of course, we need to judge righteously. We don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to be those types of people. So how are we going to judge righteously? Jesus Christ gives us how in verse number 30 Jesus says I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just and he tells us why because I seek not mine own will but the will of the father which hath sent me Jesus saying the reason why my judgment's just is because I'm not just leaving it up to me saying I'm just following exactly what the father said his word, his direction, his instruction. If you can follow the word of God to that level and just say, it's not what I want to happen. Because when you start letting your own feelings or emotions or what you want to have happen in a judgment influence your judgment, then you're not judging righteously. You have the rich person in church and the poor person in church have a conflict and you're going to side with the rich guy because you like his money rolling in. You don't want him to be ousted now you're judging unrighteously. You're giving favor to someone because it's your own will that you're imposing in that judgment. Instead of just saying, well, what does God's will say? What does the word of the Lord say? That's what matters, and that's where you get righteous judgment from. That's what we need to strive to make sure, one, you know the law. Know the law as well as the Levites did. Or better. Know the law as well as you can. Know God's word so that you can have the wisdom. You could judge righteously. You could discern good from evil. You could know right from wrong. And you can make the judgment call and be a judge yourself. I thank God that he's given us men to be judges, to help people to understand this is right and this is wrong because not everybody has that wisdom. 
But I believe it's incumbent upon us as Christians, people who want to espouse God's word and say, this book is important. We believe God's word. Well, you know what? A large portion of God's word is his law. And his law is what gives us our morality. God's grace doesn't give us our morality. God's forgiveness doesn't give us our morality. It's God's law. That's what tells us right from wrong. How are you going to know to do right or wrong if you don't know what God said is right and wrong? And then how could you ever possibly judge if you don't know those things either? That is why the requirement for kings, and God, even though God didn't want to have a king, says, okay, if you're going to have a king, if you choose to have a ruler that is a king, instead of a judge that God would raise up, if you decided to reject that and have a king, he says, the king needs to write down and basically have his own Bible. He needs to write down and literally have his own transcript, his own copy of God's law. And that will guarantee you that he knows it a lot better, that, you know, at least as well as he ought to, because he's supposed to be reading from it every day and have his own copy for himself personally to be able to do those judgments. That's why Solomon was blessed so much, because he what he desired and what he requested of God was the wisdom to judge the people, to rule the people, and to know right from wrong. He says, wow, this is a big task. There's a lot of people here. It's all your people, Lord. You've blessed us. There's, you've multiplied us. This is a big responsibility. Can you just please give me some wisdom to, to know how to deal with these people, to know how to give a good answer, a right judgment? That's what he wanted with his heart, and God gave it to him. And God blessed him for that, and he blessed him in many ways for that very reason. We ought to strive to want to have that wisdom to know right from wrong. And I guarantee you, even if it's not coming out and judging you know, other people, I guarantee you it's going to be a blessing in your own life when you could choose right from wrong and make judgment calls on what decision you need to make in your life, and you're choosing the right choice and, and rejecting what's wrong. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great wisdom that we could find in Scripture, Lord. I pray that you will please help us to make good judgment. Help us not to be ashamed of uh, when people might say, oh, who are you to judge? Because we can see from the Scripture that you've, you've established in your law that, that we are to judge and that we need to judge. And even Jesus Christ himself said that we need to judge, but judge righteously. We can see that all throughout the Bible that we need to be careful in our judgment, that we need to make sure that the way that we judge, we know that it's going to come back on us. But Lord, I'll stand sure right now and say that if it's your judgment that I'm judging against anybody, I'll say amen and amen because if I ever happen to do those things, Lord, I'll accept that judgment because it's right and true if it's coming from your word. And I would expect that the same judgment would fall upon me as upon anybody else, Lord. I pray that you will please just help us to have a good testimony and to not be guilty and not be hypocrites in our judgment so that we, could, so that we wouldn't bring a bad name upon you and upon your laws, dear Lord, but help us strive to, to increasingly get the sin out of our lives that we could have a good testimony and that our judgment would be pure and good and right. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.